I'm very grateful uh, to you to have uh, put in place uh, this fabulous uh, program on uh, fiscal risks and the management of a public sector balance sheets. Uh, you did it in a way which is exactly timely from the viewpoint of the uh, Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund because in a year's time, in the fall, our fiscal monitor, which is our most important publication, will be precisely on how to use public sector uh, balance sheets to manage uh, fiscal risks. And given that we still have a bit of time, uh, being able to motivate top researchers like yourselves to do work on these uh, topics is strategically very important for us. For us, the relationship with researchers, with academia, is a first uh, priority. And Jürgen, uh, you have been instrumental in facilitating uh, this process. And that's why we are so grateful uh, uh, to you uh, for uh, taking this initiative. Now, the way I will structure this talk is the following. I will spend a couple of minutes giving you my motivation uh, to uh, put so much, to invest so much into this project. And that will be like a uh, personal testimony. And then I will very quickly highlight a number of very important things in this domain that we're doing in the Fiscal Affairs Department. Clearly, I have too much material. I have, uh, it would take too long to cover it, but regard it as like a signal that all those issues are wish issues that we're very happy to discuss. And we definitely expect that you will engage uh, in a very lively discussion after I have spoken for about 25 minutes. And then I'm even hopeful that we will continue over dinner. And uh, the, I'm very encouraged that Aitor has already something that he wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the story that I want to uh, tell you to motivate my commitment to this project is a story that I'm stealing from uh, Jacob Sol, who is an historian, and he has written about these issues of uh, uh, public sector accounting and how that interacts with politics. So this, to my mind, is very much about information and it's about politics. And the wonderful story that Jacob Sol puts together is a story about uh, Louis XIV and his finance minister Colbert. Colbert was a man who is known for many things, but something which is not often uh, mentioned is that he was very interested in accounting. And he was interested in accounting because he wanted to manage the state. He wanted to manage the French state. So it was not corporate accounting that he was interested on. It was public sector accounting. And so he launched a teaching program of accounting to train French public servants to go about accounting in a systematic way. But he did not wait for that program to be completed to start doing public sector accounting and, uh, in a sense, inform the king about the importance of that. So, knowing that the king is very busy, he decided to compile a very small book that was an absolutely beautiful book, but small that the book that the king could carry in his pocket. And that book was normally produced twice a year. It included the French state revenues and the French state expenditures 
<coughs> but also an account of assets and liabilities computed in accordance with double entry conventions. And I may have told you already that this was normally produced for the king twice a year. So every semester, Louis XIV uh, would get the updated information on the state of his finances. And Colbert was very important in the life of Louis XIV from a political viewpoint. He was a political ally and one of the most effective political agents of Louis XIV. So this book was published until it was uh, produced, pardon me, until the death of Colbert, which happened in 1683. But as soon as Colbert died, Louis XIV discontinued the book. Why was that? Well, because the book probably reminded him that Colbert was always emphasizing the cost of his projects that included building the Versailles Palace and the costs that were even bigger associated with the wars that Louis XIV uh, was involved in. So as soon as Colbert died, uh, the priority of Louis XIV was to put in place the true motto, which was l'état c'est moi. He did not want to have a strong French public service that would render him accountable. So, in my interpretation, the decision by Louis XIV to discontinue the little book, which was called the gold book because it was embroidered in gold, was a fundamental political decision. The less public information exists on the state of public finances, the harder it is for governments to be accountable for the state of public finances. So if you're a politician and you want to maximize discretion, you do not want to have good information in the public domain. That's how I interpret the story of Louis XIV. And that puts together two things that we have been discussing all day, which is the political dimension of public finances together with the information dimension of public finances. It is my deep belief that in a democratic society, we, the citizens, are entitled to have good information on public finances and that is a fundamental characteristic of a well-functioning democratic society. And that's one of the reasons why this investment in getting good public sector balance sheet information and invest in looking at fiscal policy as a risk management tool is so crucially important for the good functioning of our societies. So this is my passionate editorial. Let's go to what is the IMF involved in at this point in time. So we have uh, documented why fiscal risks matter. Uh, we have looked at the recent episodes of uh, uh, materialization of fiscal uh, mm -hmm. risks and have uh, listed the lessons learned in that process, we advocate a systematic approach to fiscal risk and we have tons of questions that we would love people like yourselves to answer. <clears throat> so one of the things that impresses me is that when you have a forecast of public debt, you normally have it exactly like in this uh, uh, chart, that is. Go back to the spring of 2007, and what you see is that the forecast 
for public debt was very flat and the uh, slope is gently downward sloping. But that is not what happened. A number of unforeseen events materialized and for the advanced economies the debt to GDP ratio was actually revised up relative to the original forecast by 37 percentage points of uh, GDP. Given data like this, uh, today we uh, don't find it necessary to argue much about the relevance of fiscal risks. It's very clear that fiscal risks matter, that fiscal risks are big. They come from a uh, bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, sources and uh, this is based on IMF uh, research that covers 25 years uh, starting in uh, the 1990s and what we have is that the most important factor explaining the revisions in the public debt is macroeconomic shocks followed by the financial sector and among the less important sources of revisions is the materialization of risks from uh, public-private partnerships which is mainly due to the fact that the aggregate importance of public-private partnerships during this period was low. So it's not that public-private partnerships are not risky instruments, they are, but the importance of that instrument in the financing of uh, investment projects was low in the period considered. Now this is something that again uh, I think tells a good story. It's a story about <coughs> Portugal so George uh, Coppit uh, will, he's a member of the Portuguese Fiscal Council, will know about and we also have Nuno who is from the staff of the Fiscal Council and I'm reporting on something that the IMF is uh, very proud of which is our fiscal transparency evaluations. And we have carried out fiscal transparency evaluations for 22 countries including Portugal and this is the result for Portugal. So uh, this is the state of uh, Portuguese uh, general government debt uh, as seen from the viewpoint of 2009, so just before the uh, sovereign uh, debt crisis in the euro area. And so what you see here is how that evolved over time considering the same statistical, statistical concept throughout. By the way, I should have told you that since I'm improvising, I'm not uh, following the notes that my staff prepared, if you want to know how I'm doing, look at the face of Tigran uh, and if he uh, looks very tense, that basically means that I have it completely off. So you have a 3D illustration of what's going on. Now, here in black, you have the general government gross debt under the revised statistical concept. So the level of uh, general government debt in Portugal was revised up quite sharply. Why was that? Well, first of all, because a number of state-owned enterprises and public-private partnerships were reclassified. They were reclassified because the idea that they could finance themselves autonomously without uh, general government support was refuted by facts. And if you look at the size of the red bar, you can guess why I don't uh, subscribe to the idea that risks associated with PPPs are small. Then uh, the uh, green uh, add up has to do with the uh, costs of a financial uh, sector uh, bailout. So, so they have to do with the uh, financial crisis that occurred in the period. And what you see in yellow 
is the addition having to do with arrears. And what you see is that arrears are not negligible, but were not a big deal in the Portuguese case. But you have in gray the uh, level of uh, debt which is associated with state-owned enterprises and PPPs that are still uh, outside the government perimeter. I should not have said uh, still because they completely fulfill the statistical criteria uh, in place. I should say simply that they're outside the perimeter. And this is basically it. Now, uh, we have, as I said, uh, fiscal transparency evaluations for uh, 22 uh, countries. And the next couple of slides look at uh, some uh, indications uh, from those 22. But basically, I think that you got the picture from the Portuguese example. So I will jump over uh, this two slides. Social security is out of the picture. Say again? Social security. Uh, so when we do uh, the fiscal transparency evaluation, uh, one of the items that we quantify is uh, uh, liabilities associated with pensions, yes. And we quantify that for all countries that we look at. So here uh, we are going back to the fiscal monitor of the fall of last uh, year. And we're looking at something that we also discussed uh, quite a bit today, which is what happens uh, when you have a financial crisis and the uh, sovereign happens to uh, be in a weak fiscal starting position. So what we see in this uh, slide is that when the starting position is weak, the cost associated with uh, the uh, financial uh, crisis is uh, substantially uh, bigger. And uh, that is uh, particularly the case uh, for uh, emerging uh, market economies. Uh, now, th this was something that we very much stressed in the fiscal monitor a year ago because the idea is that when you're trying to forecast a financial crisis, the state of public finances is not a particularly good predictor. But once you are in a financial crisis, the uh, uh, vulnerability of the sovereign acts as an amplification mechanism. That is, costs of the financial crisis are much greater when the sovereign doesn't have the um, uh, effective ways to tackle the crisis. And of course, the sovereign bank doom loop is just an extreme manifestation of that uh, point. Now, when you have the possibility of uh, uh, public sector intervention uh, in the financial system, you raised a number of uh, very complicated design problems. Uh, and we spent quite a lot of time in the fiscal monitor looking at how those design uh, problems uh, should uh, be tackled. And uh, we cover issues that have to do with uh, uh, targeting uh, with the instruments that the government uses, the timing, and uh, we uh, highlight the importance of uh, policy complementarities. And it's very easy uh, to create substantial problems by getting some of these crucial details uh, wrong. Oops. OK. Now, if you go around the world today, the country that is being a pioneer in terms of looking at fiscal risks and promoting the balance sheet approach is New Zealand. 
And in a sense, it's very interesting that that is the case because you may recall that New Zealand was also a pioneer in the area of monetary policy with inflation targeting. So in a sense, this fits to my mind at least perfectly the theme that we should in a sense try to think about fiscal policy in a systematic rules-like way as we have done uh, for monetary policy. And that is in a sense uh, what the New Zealanders uh, uh, inspire us to do. So they go about uh, compiling uh, bal a, a balance sheet for the general government by computing a comprehensive net worth for the general government and then they go about managing fiscal risks by using basically two instruments. One is a standard value at risk approach and then to capture details they do a fiscal stress testing. And that is also what we suggest as an approach in a board paper uh, that we produced uh, about a year ago and in a sense marked from the viewpoint of the IMF the launching of uh, this uh, uh, project. <coughs> this is a mere illustration, uh, but what you do see from the, uh, this illustrative example of a New Zealand comprehensive <coughs> network, net worth is that uh, assets and liabilities of the general government are uh, very important that they dwarf the level of uh, gross public debt, which is uh, the indicator that normally people focus their attention on, and that uh, contingent liabilities, liabilities that have to do with, say, government guarantees, but also the net present value of expenses and revenue, this is what you were talking about, Ramon, uh, are uh, quite substantial and they affect the net worth in a very material way. In the case of New Zealand, the uh, comprehensive net worth is negative while the accounting network is uh, strongly positive. Okay. Now, I've already told you this, so I will not bother you with this. One of the most interesting examples of a fiscal transparency evaluation and a stress test uh, was done for Iceland. And uh, what you do get there is that uh, there is a huge difference between the, uh, uh, the baseline and the uh, various measures of stress that we come up with. But we don't have time for this. In terms of our framework, again, from the board paper, uh, we uh, suggest that we should follow uh, four steps. So this is not New Zealand. This is IMF. So we should start with uh, the anti identification and quantification of uh, risks, and we cover that in our fiscal transparency evaluations. Then look at strategies to mitigate those risks. Further, since we cannot uh, control risks perfectly, risks should be provisioned for, so provisioning should uh, be in place. But even after all of this, one should accommodate the residual and build up buffers that allow the general government to uh, play its role of insurer of less resource for macroeconomic and macro financial risks. So this is basically the approach that we uh, uh, advocate. Now in that context we also advocate as I was indicating a moment ago, that we should think about fiscal policy as the systematic conduct of a policy, very much like uh, we have done for uh, monetary policy. And in that context, we should look at fiscal policy as a risk management tool. Again, following the analogy with 
uh, monetary policy. What we have not yet been able to do, although we have produced a very nice chart with very good shades in this particular case of, gray, of uh, green, uh, but we have not been able yet to fully integrate this analysis with the balance sheet approach, which we would like to do, right? But at this point in time, the stochastic simulation of a balance sheet is beyond uh, what we can at this point in time produce. But I think that for people like yourselves, it's a uh, uh, very interesting challenge. And uh, we will do uh, the most progress that we can in the next few months because we would like uh, to um, have it uh, ready uh, for the fiscal monitor in the fall. If you don't mind, I would postpone uh, questions to after the presentation uh, to preserve the flow. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm about to finish, so you will not have to wait much. How am I doing with time, Jurgen? Yeah, another four or five minutes. Okay. So uh, I will be shorter than that. If not, I would have to slow down quite. Uh, I will not. So the bottom line is that we need to develop a comprehensive balance sheet. And uh, we would like to cover not only the general government, but to have a good notion of how public sector controlled entities, state-owned enterprises, affect the balance sheet. We would like, uh, in a sense, to make the balance sheet approach compatible with a long-term way of looking at the general government. So we would like stocks and flows to be fully compatible. We would like to have a story behind the valuation of the various assets and liabilities. Now, we believe that risks that affect the public sector are strongly correlated. And I think that we have very good examples of that during the global financial crisis. And hence, uh, moving from a focus on debt to a focus on net worth, looking at risks to sustainability in that sense, and taking into account the characteristics of assets and liabilities when we look at rollover risk seems to us to be a, uh, the way to go. Something that is really big when you go for a balance sheet approach is that valuation effects are often dominant. For example, when you have debt denominated in your own currency, the uh, amount of risk sharing that you can have with the rest of the world is considerably bigger. If, on the contrary, you have issued debt in foreign currency, you're vulnerable to a number of very important macroeconomic uh, uh, disturbances that uh, would not uh, occur if you were uh, indebted in uh, your uh, national debt. So the characteristics, the detailed characteristics of assets and liabilities matter a lot. Now, questions for you. How can we quantify and how can we provide for fiscal re risks. How can we characterize a prudent fiscal policy and how can we make it operational and visible politically? So this is the first question that I would love you to answer. When we follow, second question, this comprehensive balance sheet approach how do we go about evaluating a balance sheet? When do we conclude 
that a balance sheet for the public sector is a strong and resilient balance sheet. How do we make that assessment? Now, the third is, once we have all this information, how can we design systematic fiscal policy behavior so that we get better results in terms of macroeconomic performance, say growth, macroeconomic performance, say equity, uh, macroeconomic uh, performance, say stability and resilience. And how do we articulate the uh, normative uh, evaluation metrics that uh, we want to use? So, uh, look, I really think that we have a wonderful opportunity to think systematically about fiscal policy in a way that revisits the ground that we have explored in the last few years, trying to be as ordered and as systematic as we possibly can, taking into account that the degree of complexity of fiscal policy is substantially greater than uh, monetary policy, and that the instruments of a fiscal policy are much richer than the instruments of uh, uh, monetary policy. So the issue is definitely more challenging, I believe, but precisely because it is uh, more challenging, we need researchers to take the challenge very seriously because the more complex the problem is, the more we need clear thinking, and clear thinking comes from the conceptual uh, frameworks that are developed by people like yourselves. So since I've already asked the questions, it's now up to you to give the answers. Thank you. <laughs>